when I was dating Nancy, I heard the name Mr. Fletcher on numerous occasions, usually from the lips of her parents. Mr. Fletcher was their neighbor. His land bordered their two-acre lot. But even though I often heard the name Mr. Fletcher, I didn't really know much about him. At least I didn't know much about him until last year. That's when I read his obituary. It reads, Bob Fletcher, a Sacramento farmer, volunteer, and man of courage and conviction, who saved the farms of interned Japanese-American families during World War II. He died May 23rd, 2013. He was 101. Mr. Fletcher demonstrated the finest human values in one of the darkest periods of American history. It was 1942, a few months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, when the U.S. government forced Japanese immigrants and Americans of Japanese descent to report to barbed wire camps. Many lost their homes to thieves and bank foreclosures. A state agricultural inspector, Mr. Fletcher acted instinctively to help Japanese American farmers. He quit his job and went to work saving farms belonging to the Nita, Akamoto, and Sukamoto families in the Florin community. In the face of deep anti-Japanese sentiment, including taunts of Jap lover and a bullet fired into the Sukamoto barn, Mr. Fletcher worked 90 acres of flame toke grapes. He paid the mortgages and taxes and took half the profits and he turned over the rest of the profits along with the farms to the three families when they returned to Sacramento in 1945. I did know a few of them pretty well and never agreed to the, with the evacuation, he told the Sacramento Bee in 2010. They were the same as anybody else. It was obvious they had nothing to do with Pearl Harbor. Before reading that obituary, Mr. Fletcher was just a name to me. Now I can't hear the name Mr. Fletcher without thinking of courage, of kindness, of integrity, and of self-sacrifice for the sake of others. By every human standard, Mr. Fletcher was a good man. And by every human standard, he should be remembered as such. But what does it mean to be a good man, a good woman, in God's eyes? When we pronounce someone to be good, is our judgment in line with God's judgment? Is it safe to assume that the people we deem to be good will go to heaven, while those we deem to be bad will end up in hell? In other words, are God's standards of goodness and human standards of goodness the same? I think that's a question the Apostle Paul has been addressing for us these past four weeks. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, Paul demonstrated that even people without the Bible, even people without God's written word, do in fact have a real knowledge of God and that all such people will be judged based on that knowledge, the knowledge that God gives all people in his creation. Then in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 8, Paul has challenged sincere, practicing Jewish people to not presume on their outward morality or on their religious heritage to automatically deliver them from judgment and hell. On the contrary, Paul has made the point that apart from saving faith in Jesus Christ, both Jew and non-Jew, all stand condemned before God. 
Well, today in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, Paul sums up God's revelation regarding human sin and its impact on our standing before him as our creator. But before we read Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, I need to tell you up front that many people find Paul's conclusions about our sinful human condition not only to be offensive, but to even be dangerous. And if that's where you're at, all I ask today is that you give these words of Paul a fair hearing. All I ask is that as we read Paul's words, you look around you and you look into even your own heart and see if Paul's words might in fact be true. Let's start with Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 18. Having already established that both Jew and Gentile stand under the wrath of God, Romans 3, beginning with verse 9, reads, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their bitterness is full. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul's words are crystal clear. And his conclusions are obvious. No matter how positive we feel about ourselves, no matter how generous we might be in our judgments of one another, without Jesus... No man, no woman is, nor can they be, good in God's eyes. Paul tells us that God views us differently than we view ourselves. Paul tells us that God judges us differently than we tend to judge each other. God's standards of righteousness are not the same as our human standards of righteousness. You see, when we judge, we tend to compare each other with one another, with other people. But when God judges, Paul reminds us that God compares you and me individually with himself. And that means God's standard of righteousness is perfection. And if that's not bad enough, we need to remember that when God judges you and me, He judges us with perfect knowledge. In other words, God sees what no one else can see about us. God hears what no one else can hear, including our thoughts. God knows the ugliness that resides in every one of our hearts. And that's why in Romans chapter 3, verse 9, Paul declares that all people, both Jews and Greeks, all people are under sin. Under sin. And please notice that Paul does not say we are under sins, plural. Paul says we're under sin, singular. You see, sins, plural, That speaks of all those things we do, all those things we think, all those things that we say 
that violate God's perfect character and God's perfect law. But sin, singular, as bad as sins are, Sin, singular, represents something far more destructive. Sin, singular, represents a warped bent of our heart. Sin, singular, represents our fixed inclination towards self-worship, self-centeredness, and self-deception. Sin, singular, represents a state of being out of which we continuously assert ourselves against God. In other words, sin, singular, is a natural condition of our fallen human hearts from which all our sins, plural, spring. And here in verse 9, Paul declares that this warped, This anti-God bent of heart enslaves every man, every woman, and every child who has lived, does live, and will yet live without Jesus Christ. And in case we're tempted to deny that we ourselves are under sin, in bondage to sin, then we need to remember or to see here that Paul strings together a series of at least six Old Testament passages to demonstrate from Scripture itself that our enslavement to sin is not only real, but it is universal. It impacts every human being who's ever lived except Jesus. In just three verses... We hear Paul make seven absolute statements regarding the depravity, the sin of every human being. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Paul makes it clear that except for Christ, no human being is and no human being ever has been good in the eyes of God. Listen again, beginning with verse 10. Paul says, As it is written, again, from the Old Testament, from Scripture, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Do you hear it? Against any claim that we might make that there's such a thing as a good man or a truly good woman, Paul offers seven absolute denials rooted in Scripture. Listen again. None is righteous. No, not one. No one. No one. All have turned. No one does good. And in case we still want to argue... He says, not even one. Not even one. Now, I don't know how the apostle could make this more clear. Left to ourselves, we are all slaves to sin. And we are all willing participants in sin. And that is why Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 declares... Isaiah 64, 6 declares, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment or literally like a filthy used minstrel rag. In other words, our best as human beings is dirty and gross to God. Our best is dirty and gross. And that's why I shudder whenever I hear someone say, well, I'm a good person. And it's why I shudder even more 
when I find myself tempted to say the same. You see, left to yourself, you are not a good person. You are not. And neither am I. Left to ourselves, there's no one who understands God. There's no one who even desires to understand God. There's no one left to themselves who would ever seek God. And so in the end, it's not you, it's not me who seeks God at all. If we have an interest in God, if we're seeking God at all, understand that it's because God has first sought you. God has first sought me. Any interest you have in God is a gift that comes from Him. And this is a hard passage. And I know its truths are hard to accept. I know that what Paul says here goes against everything they told you in school about the importance of self-esteem. But if we don't get this right, then we do not have any hope of salvation. If you do not understand the depth of your sin and your separation from God, then you will never grasp the riches of His grace. And that's why Paul continues... He continues to hammer his point home. Having now stated the fact of our universal guilt and our universal sin, Paul gives evidence of that sin by calling us to stop and consider just the way we use our mouths. Romans 3, 13 and 14. Paul talks about each of us and he talks about all of us when he writes, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Now what's Paul mean when he says that as fallen people, our throat is an open grave? Remember that Paul was a Jew. And for a Jew, an open grave was a place of defilement. In the Old Testament, touching a dead body defiled you. It made you unclean. And so when Paul compares our throats to an open grave, he's telling us that the words we speak have the power to defile us even like a dead body had the power to defile an Israelite. Now that should not surprise us at all. It shouldn't surprise us because Jesus himself declares the very same thing in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11. Matthew 15, 11, Jesus says, It is not what goes into the mouth, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. It's what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. In verses 18 through 20, Jesus continues, What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Jesus says, These are what defile a person. So let's stop. And let me ask the question. Have you ever taken time and listened to the words that come out of your mouth? Have you ever considered what your words reveal about the wickedness of your heart apart from Christ? Here's the challenge. Let's all listen closely to ourselves this week. Let's listen to ourselves this week. And let's think carefully about the motivation behind everything we say. And I'm sure that you'll hear yourself speak some kind words, some encouraging words. But if you listen to everything you say and you listen honestly, you're also going to hear 
some ugly, arrogant, arrogant self-condemning self self words as well. As well. Listen, Listen to yourself closely this week. And then come, and then come back next week and tell, and tell me if you don't hear words out of your mouth that express your own impatience. Tell me you don't hear any words out of your mouth that exposes the presence of bitterness or anger in your heart. Tell me you've never spoken words that tear other people down for the sake of building yourself up. Tell me you've never gossiped. Have you never lied? Do you still not at times lie? Have you never spoken half the truth? when God would call you to speak the whole. Tell me that you have never practiced backbiting. Tell me you've never been cutting or sarcastic with your tongue. Tell me your words have never been lustful or filthy. Tell me your words have never been arrogant or manipulating. That your words have never been slanderous. They've never been murderous. Tell me you have never cursed another man, cursed another woman made in the image of God. Tell me you've never selfishly whined or complained when things didn't go your way. And then remember, let's all remember that every word we have ever spoken, we have spoken in the presence of of the one before whom we must stand on the last day. Remember, Jesus Himself promised us that on the day of judgment, every person, and I quote Jesus, will give account for every careless word they speak. But Paul does more than call us to consider the evidence of our own depravity found in the way that we use our tongue. Paul also calls us to recognize the reality of universal sin that's revealed in the never-ending violence that marks our world, our society. Romans 3, now verses 15 through 17. Paul continues to speak of humanity, continues to speak of you and me, when he says, their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. Have you noticed how easily we lose our cool? How easy it is to quarrel, to fight? You know that the unending presence of war the unending presence in our world of terrorism, violent crime, and even the struggle you and I have controlling our own tempers. All these things demonstrate the reality of universal human sin. It reveals that none is righteous, no, not one. It reveals that no one understands, no one seeks God, no one does good, not even one. Not even you. Not even me. And it reveals, as verse 18 concludes, there is no fear of God before their eyes. How many people, and maybe us as we go through our week, hardly give a second thought to God yet alone fear Him. No fear of God before their eyes. Which now brings us to Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Again, follow as I read. Having now established that there is no such thing as a good person in God's eyes. In verse 19, Paul continues, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped 
and the whole world may be held accountable, accountable to God. For by works of the law, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes obedience, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The knowledge of sin in my heart, the knowledge of sin in your heart. Beginning with Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and ending with Romans chapter 3, verse 18, Paul establishes that apart from faith in Jesus Christ, both the Gentiles who didn't have God's written word and the Jews who did have God's written word, both stood condemned before God because of their sin. Paul has stated, the Gentiles stand condemned apart from the law. And the Jews and those who possess God's word stand condemned under the law. So what's Paul's point? Why does Paul spend, why has he spent two full chapters of this book proving that every person is a hopeless sinner? Why has he hammered the point home? Why has he bent over backwards to demonstrate that there's no such thing as a righteous man? There is no such thing as a righteous woman. Paul tells us why he has spent these two chapters hammering home that point in the first half of verse 20 when he declares, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. For the last four weeks, this makes it the fifth week. Romans has taught us one lesson and one basic lesson only. Whether you are a religious person or not, whether you grew up in church or not, whether you know the Bible or don't know the Bible, whether you are a practicing Baptist, a practicing Catholic, a practicing Mormon, a practicing Lutheran, Jew, or atheist, we are all the same. We're all the same. By nature and by choice, we are all rebellious sinners, worthy of God's judgment, and we are subject to God's wrath. And according to Paul, not one of us, not one of us can save ourselves by trying to keep God's law. Not one of us can save ourselves by being religious. Not one of us can save ourselves by trying to be worthy. Not one of us can make ourselves righteous. Not one of us can make ourselves good in the eyes of God. We are, each of us, and all of us together, hopelessly lost. And based on our own merit, based on our own merit, every one of us stands condemned before God. And now, now that we understand that, and I hope you do understand that. Now, now we are ready to hear God's gospel. Now that we know we have no righteousness of our own, we are ready to hear about the righteousness that God offers us in Jesus Christ. It's the righteousness that God made manifest apart from the law. It's the righteousness of God that comes to us through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. 
It's the only righteousness that God accepts. It's the only righteousness that can save you, that can save me from our sins. And it is the righteousness that we are going to begin to learn about next Sunday in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. So tune in next week.